everyone. Welcome to Allegory Story. My name is Tegan Aline. My name is Melanie Nevis. And welcome to season five. Are we in season five already? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yay! <season laughs> I think so. Five. <laughs> and um, hopefully it's not season four. I'm pretty sure it's season five. But this season, we so. are going to do our best to deep dive and also <laughs> wade through the so much information <laughs> that pertains to Celtic mythology, Celtic heritage, all of those things, mm-hmm. all things Celtic. So welcome to this season of Allegory Story where we dive into the Celts. Yeah. And like right off the bat, forgive us for our pronunciation. We'll do the best we can, but... I'm going to try. I don't think... I want to say that my pronunciation is a little bit better when it comes to this stuff, but then I feel like I'm going to shoot myself in the foot by saying that. So let's assume not. I try. We're going to gonna just best. try and a blanket apology if we fail. I forgot to mention to this earlier. I got a book. I don't know if you can see it. Celtic um, Tales. Ooh, nice. Yeah, on Celtic fairy tales and like stories of enchantment. So I have a book like that too, actually. And I've been oh, carrying Yeah. I've been carrying it around from me with me since I was there's a few things that I've held on to since I was like a teenager when I first got into all of this nice. stuff. And the classic Celtic fairy tales is one that I brought with me from Canada to France and I still have it and I've been revisiting it nice. um, recently because I just love all that stuff. I was I, I have to say, I think that this was the gateway for me, like Celtic. Oh, was it? I think so. Celtic fairy tales, but also fairies were yeah were the gateway for me when I was really, really young. Ooh. I know. Isn't oh. that such nice imagery? Oh, so beautiful. Oh <laughs> Look God. at that. She's got a spindle. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, gee, here we are sitting in the first season wondering where all the spindle references come from. Uh, hello, <laughs> Celtic fairy fairy tales, apparently. <laughs> we'll have to, well, maybe we should do an episode on Celtic fairy tales, some of our favorite ones. Yeah. But yeah, I really think this was my gateway for sure. Um, and, and not to say that I even learned a lot about it when I was younger, but it was the thing that fascinated me first. And then from Mm -hmm. there, I kind of stemmed into everything. Also, I think I've mentioned it before on the podcast that I'm Welsh. My name, like on my dad's side, I'm Welsh. My name, Tegan, is Welsh. And it's always been kind of like a part of me I didn't necessarily know so much about. So I think I liked to connect to, you know, kind of part of my heritage through that in, in some way. And there were so many things that were out there that were Welsh in nature. Like we just did a season on, um, on King Arthur there's so much reference Mm -hmm. within that that's Welsh that I never even knew growing up so it's always been such a surprise to me to to understand like how how it really went down because I think I think we as I'll speak for myself on this you can tell me if you agree but I think we as North Americans kind of have a particular idea when you hear about Celtic things it's Mm -hmm. kind of it's pretty boxed in like yeah. What did you like when you first heard about that stuff growing up? What came into your like, what was your understanding of it? So I think, and I think that this is because we had a really large wave of Irish migrants coming to Canada. But I think yeah. that when I would hear about Celtic, Celtic tales and Celtic mythology, I actually associated it with Ireland first and foremost. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And it's not just like that the Celts were in just the just Ireland or just the UK. Yeah. No, they no, weren't. No, no. They were like all over the place. Yes. And um, but I I I think that we just have this association with Celtic tales being Irish. Yes. Which a lot of them are. And yes. in Canada, that's just what we think. I think it's also where a lot of the surviving documentation that we have. Or yeah. archaeological evidence that we have survives. Yeah, I think I took a course. I didn't finish this course. I've taken quite a few courses around this stuff, um, not Celtic stuff, but around mythologies and magical practices and this kind of thing. I started taking the Celtic course 
And I was not ready for the <laughs> amount. It, it, it was a fantastic course in terms of it was like so deeply in depth, but it was almost like too in depth for me at the time. But um, yeah. it, I, at the time, yeah, I think my, I think part of the reason why we associate a lot of the Celtic lore with the Irish culture is because during Christianization, they mm -hmm. actually, they basically transitioned the Irish lore into Christianization. And that's like, you know, where we get the Celtic knot and all of these different symbols and stuff. So they, like the Irish culture actually did a really good job of amal amalgamating into Christianity. And I think in part, uh, that's partially why, because it was still connected. It still had a connection in through the church for the Irish. Yeah. And like you said, there was a there were a lot of Irish immigrants coming into Canada, you know, coming mm -hmm. into the United States and they were holding on to their heritage and and at the time their heritage was was Celtic but it was like Christian Celtic, you know what I mean? So I feel like that it's is a gateway for like a lot of people to get kind of like get into this kind of thing and get interested in it in a way, you know? It's true. I think it's kind of funny that we are recording this shortly after in bulk, which was just two yes. days ago. Yeah. Which in Ireland is now known as St. Bridget's Day. Oh, okay. But yeah. Bridget was an Irish or sorry, a Celtic goddess. Yeah, and actually, I think she became is... a Catholic saint. <laughs> yeah, like like we've seen so many times, right? Like, yeah, the way that things kind of just take on a new life in in a new religion, or predominant people take on a new life in a new religion. I think even to this day, like, yeah, she's considered a revered goddess in Ireland, Bridget. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. and of course. Of course, all of the big ones get a saint's day. Of that course. Goes, goes but it's just day. so fascinating. Like, she is really renowned in this Celtic tradition. And they kind of just moved her over and, like, she she became a saint. Yeah. And she's and, still celebrated. Yeah. And it's kind of like what you what you had kind of alluded to earlier. We kind of think that we think Celtic. I think a lot of us tend to go to Irish and we kind of think that Celtic was like specifically in one part. We think now, I guess with a bit of time, we now think Ireland, Scotland, the UK has a Celtic mm -hmm. background. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, I know that for me up until I took that program, I also thought that it started there. Like that culture started yes. there. But yes. I mean, when you do some more digging and some more learning in it, you first first thing you understand is that the Celts have been around in various forms since the Bronze Age, expanding mm -hmm. through the Iron Age. Um, a lot of that beautiful, the beginning of the beautiful work we start to see in the jewelry and things like that come with Latin, Latin culture, which is like the 5th, the 1st century BCE. It's a really, really interesting part of Celtic culture. Uh, culture and or Celtic history and if we went into depth through the ages of all of the different information like you know that could be a whole season in itself so we won't <laughs> do that but if you're really into history I would suggest looking it up because it's really fascinating but mm -hmm. I believe if I remember correctly I believe like they have found stuff from the the Latin Latin culture in like Switzerland, um, you know, yeah. the Balkans. <laughs> All yeah, the yeah. Things. Honestly, we, like Celtic culture, y y you'll find it all over Western Europe and then into yeah. Eastern Europe. And we see, we tend to think that it started in like, you know, Ireland, Scotland, UK area and expanded out. But actually it's the other way around. It like started yes. in, in closer in inland Europe and spread out to those yeah. areas. And we were talking about this a little bit uh, uh, before the podcast, but like even um, so in France, there is a huge, there is a Celtic culture, which I'll actually dive into that a little bit later, but also there's also Celtic culture on the coast of Spain and mm -hmm. Portugal. 
and, <laughs> and Portugal. Yeah. And you can pretty yeah. much, if you look at a map and you look at the Atlantic coast, you can pretty much, you can see, you can see the UK, you can see Ireland. And then it's basically like they've sailed more or less along that entire coastline as long as they did. Mm -hmm. And however they did it for whatever reasons they did it, whether it was trade or whatever, uh, that culture is prevalent all the way along. It's even prevalent as far as Turkey. <laughs> Which is crazy. It's, like it's, it's wild. Crazy. Like, but, but this is how things are widespread and, and the one thing I will say about the Romans, yeah. <laughs> I'll say a lot about the Romans, but There's I will so say that support. anyone that was in direct competition in any way or any culture that was prevalent while they were trying to expand and they wanted to subjugate them, um, they had to like have really been quite popular and had made their mark in order for the Romans to actually want to conquer and subjugate. Yeah. And that that's so, and that's so true because I think where they really see a rise in their people and their migrations and their, and their, you know, um, expansion, um, it's before the Roman conquest. And once the first century mm -hmm. BC rolls around and the Roman conquest mm -hmm. kind of comes in, we start to see a decline and we see a lot of, yeah. we see a lot of, sh of shifts and I, and you know, like, I think it's really funny. I thought afterwards I, I thought about this and I thought it was super funny that we decided to do this season after the Arthurian season, because the Arthurian legends Kate were birthed out of a time after the, <laughs> like, so first the Celts were all up in the yeah. grills doing the things. And then the Romans came in and took over. And then like hundreds of years went by and then they bailed. And then nobody knew what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. And the Arthurian legends were actually bred out of that. So we've like kind of skipped that whole chunk of like Roman invasion just because we know that that's going to be such a deep dive. Yeah. <laughs> but this is like the prequel <laughs> to the Arthurian stuff almost in a certain way. It's kind of it really is. It yeah. really, really is. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it, they've got such a, like, it's such a long history and spread out through so much time. Yeah. And with any ancient tradition, um, it's an oral tradition. Celtic mythology is, is shared orally. We Up kind of already talked about the Roman context. Oh yeah. And so. until, until the Christian monks started writing things down in the right. 11th century of the common era. And then we get like the oldest collection of myths being from what is called the mythological cycle, which is a grouping within Irish mythology. Mm. So most cultures from this period um, are polytheistic and the Celtic mythology is included in that. Mm -hmm. Basically, and we'll talk a little bit about the druids a little bit more about them in a different episodes but it was really up to the druids to retain a lot of like the heavy information mm -hmm. yeah. and that kind of pertains to myths on gods and goddesses and like major heroes and things like that um but again like there's no written record so everything we know about celtic religion and its mythology and the deities is inferred from secondhand sources and archaeological discoveries. So yeah, we, it's we, piecemeals, in fact, in a lot of ways. It's piecemeals. We don't know all the deities. A lot of their names are lost to history. A lot of them are very regional, specific mm -hmm. to only like a little area. Like we've seen um, throughout Europe so far as we've yeah. explored all of these different stories and things like that, right? Yeah. So yeah. there's like maybe over 400 gods not all of them are universally worshipped across Iron Age Europe, with exce the exception of Lu, maybe, who's worshipped, like, all over the place. Who's and like, so that begs the, the question. God, is he the god of, like, making things? <laughs> That's not the right way to say it, but the god. The god Lu, of he's like, kind of, like, a pretty all-powerful god. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah. our episode today is all about the Celtic pantheon, and I think we both came to a conclusion upon doing the research for this that there isn't one yeah 
So I, I mean, yeah. the first thing, the first thing I found right away, cause like, obviously like my reference going into this is I've, I've read a bunch of, you know, like folkloric tales. I've read a lot about Welsh, like witchcraft and things like that, but, um, I hadn't really looked at it as like a whole, you know what I mean? So right. Mm-hmm. I feel like the very first thing I looked at, it was like, unlike the Greeks or the Romans, there's not a panic. <laughs> <Yeah. on it. laughs> there's just like a yeah. whole bunch of, there's like a whole bunch of gods. And I think that has something to do with the fact, like, again, what we were saying earlier, a lot of us like seem to think of like Celts as like maybe one or two different places, but not only were, were Celts massively spread through Europe, but also there was many different groups with within mm-hmm. that, right? So mm-hmm. um, I made a little list of the groups. Okay. And we won't go <laughs> too deep, but I think it's interesting to kind of like just explore these groups. And now like what you just said is still the case. So there are probably many, many more than this. These are just kind of like the mm-hmm. big groups that like most people who have done studying on history, like studying this, like no, but there's probably many, many small ones. So first we'll start with one of the obvious ones, which is the Britons. Mm -hmm. And the Britons were the Celtic peoples who inhabited the British Isles, uh, what we would consider like England and Scotland, Wales, which I always thought was, which I kind of learned through the Arthurian legends that they were kind of considered the original Britons, which I didn't Mm -hmm. realize before. Um, and parts of Ireland. And within that, of course, they were divided into tribes yeah. of their own within that, right? Yeah. And we also have um, the Brythonic Celts. And that's kind of if you dive a little bit de- deeper, it's interesting because the Brythonic Celts were specifically from Wales, Cornwall, and Brittany. And this has a lot to do with like the type of language that they were speaking. But Mm -hmm. when I say Brittany, I'm speaking of Brittany in France, not in. Yes. Not like Great Britain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Yeah. So it's really interesting. And again, uh, Wales, Cornwall and Brittany are all coastline spaces, right? I was pretty Mm -hmm. surprised when I moved to France and my husband's grandparents they used to have a house in Brittany and his grandmother would tell me all the stories about the British or or, sorry the um the Celtic culture there (laughs) and I was like what do you mean there's Celtic culture in France like how what (laughs) yeah yeah so widespread yeah and then we also have the Gales the Gales are kind of like we're more situated to Scotland Mm mm-hmm we have the Godelect Celts, which were primarily on the Isle of Man. We have the Gauls, which is what we saw predominantly outside of Brittany, what we saw predominantly through France. So where I live in France is definitely Gaul territory. Most yeah, of France is considered Gaul. Um, basically, like the Gauls are the ones that really came from the European continent. Yes. And, and just in case I haven't made it clear at any other point before, I'm, I'm sure I brought it up but I'm sure maybe I didn't make it clear. Gallo-Roman is actually when the Romans come into France and they Mm -hmm. kind of start to cohabitate. And from what I understand from this area that I live in, it was a relatively, it wasn't like a hard takeover. It was just kind of like a mutual, which is why we Mm -hmm. get the name Gallo-Roman. But the Gallo element is from the Gauls. So the Celtic Roman merging that happened mm-hmm. throughout most of France. And you'll hear, hear that term a lot. And that's where that term kind of comes from. And then we have the Galatians, which were like mm-hmm. a tribe in Anatola, <laughs> in Turkey. But also, you know, like we said, Spain has Galicia. So I'm sure there's a connection yeah. within that somewhere as well. But these are just Very some well of the... These are just some of the main groups. Of course, there were many other groups, but you you know, there's not just one specific cultural identity. And I think we've seen that a lot through most of the things that we've explored. Things have things have always been broken down way more in detail. It still makes me <laughs> laugh because I still think about the fact that, like, as a Canadian, growing up as a Canadian, 
um, with Quebec constantly wanting to separate and become its own <laughs> country. As a child, I was like, it doesn't make sense though. We're like one big land mass. Like, what are you going to do? Like, oh no, they're so you- different. <laughs> Well, I was just like, what are they going to do with Quebec being Quebec? And now living in Europe, I feel like a total dum-dum for thinking that because it's like <laughs> everybody is split off. And like there's there's like places like Andorra that's like an entire country wedged between France and Spain. And it's like, yeah, people have been doing this stuff for centuries. But I think like, again, we didn't get brought up thinking that way and realizing that there can be so many divisions. You know what I mean? Well, Canada's also just very new, right? Yeah, like, true. That's Canada's so true. a baby country. We haven't, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we haven't gone through the history as the rest of the world has. The same it's, recorded history. And if this you know? is any indication, it's pretty, pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> so to go back to it really quickly, um, the Pantheon, the idea of what we have for Pantheon fits Greco-Roman mythology really well mm. because each god has a very specific function. So Poseidon is the god of the sea and Apollo is the sun god. Aphrodite is this goddess of love. And we draw a pretty direct line from Poseidon, who's our Greek god of the sea, to Neptune, who's the Roman god of the sea, because Romans drew directly from the Greeks. Um, this doesn't really work as well when we're talking about Celtic gods and goddesses because they're, what we know of them is very vague or they may have a bunch of different functions all mashed into one. So um, the Irish goddess that we already mentioned, Bridia or Bridget, I don't know. <laughs> um, it goes by both. Is the, yeah, it goes by both, right? Depending so on. She's, yeah. she's the goddess of poetry also the goddess of healing also the goddess of smithing so you know poetry and healing i can kind of see going together but then she's also this metal worker which throws you for a little bit of a loop which is Um, kind of interesting actually that's cool yeah so you have some gods that and goddesses that are just like this mishmash of things so it's not it it's and and like again like celtic mythology is really dispersed some deities have really rich mythologies others we don't really have myths for them so we learn from history and archaeology and from inscriptions and in different geographical areas so yeah there isn't a pantheon and it's all very nuanced and messy let's Mm -hmm. say Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's true but with that being said there are some more prominent ones that we can kind of touch on a little bit yeah and For sure. But I will also say, like, before we touch on the actual different gods, I will also say that although there's, like, it's a lot more nuanced and messy, the really interesting thing, I think, is that there are several archetypes that we've already seen that are still found in the Celtic pantheon as well. Mm -hmm. So you still find, like, horns deities, triple goddesses, sovereignty goddesses, which basically just Mm -hmm. denotes a, a goddess who is personifying a territory, and trickster gods. Mm -hmm. which I think is just interesting. So like it's a mishmash, but we do have these archetypes already built in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that kind of shows a bit, again, through stories, we often see the way, like if we know what we're looking at, we kind of know that when we're looking at these stories of these gods or whoever, just stories in general, we're looking at migration through the stories Mm -hmm. right so you can kind Mm -hmm. of see that in the fact that there are similarities to like other other groups and other cultures that we've kind of looked at before yeah so that's really cool yeah so I guess to just kind of do a, a a general overview and we will at some point like do a deep dive on some of these um some of these deities like later on but to just kind of give, an, since this is kind of like an overview of like the structure of it all, for the Irish Celtic deities, the most popular ones are, of course, we've talked about Bridget. And in, in Ireland, she's a goddess of fertility, healing, and poetry. We talked about Lou, the horn god, and he's a god of skill, craftsmanship, the sun. Very, very exactly what you were just talking about how they have like kind of various roles that they play 
Mm-hmm. There's more gain associated with sovereignty and war and, and found, and we've already like kind of talked about that person and how that, that deity evolves into people, into characters and stories and stuff. And mm-hmm. uh, Dagda as well. And then in the British Celtic deities, we have Bridget again. And yep. so it's interesting, Some right? Some overlap, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Belenus, worshipped by various Br- British tribes and associated with the sun healing and fertility. Silius, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Silius, <laughs> yeah. Su- Sulius, maybe, worshipped at the sacred spring of Bath and very important to particular tribes within the British Isles. The Gaulish ones are probably one of the interesting to me because that kind of relates to where I'm living right now. But the, okay, I'm going to try to pronounce this right. There's the Gaulish deity called Cairnunus. Am I saying it right? I had no idea. Okay. So he's widely depicted (laughs) in Gaulish art and depicted um, as nature connected to fertility and the underworld, which is really interesting because we've seen a lot of these Roman deities that like hold place in these areas, even these Gallo-Roman areas that are both fertility and underworld deities. Mm-hmm. So we have Epona, revered by the Gauls as the goddess of horses, fertility, and protection. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Tutatus, worshipped by the Gaulish tribes <laughs> associated with war protection and tribal loyalty loyalty i think especially when you start to look at the deities in and the gauls from what i know of the gauls just from living here war was like very important to them Mm -hmm. and it was a very big deal and um i don't know i i haven't come across other celtic cultures where it's quite the same as it might be through the gaulish traditions you know what i mean I feel like the Gauls also worked on expanding in their own right. For a they little did. Bit, you know? They like, did. And there's some yeah, incredibly, so. there's like famous war, like famous war stories between the Gauls and the Romans where the Gauls actually defeated the Romans in Rome. So it makes, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I remember reading about that. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes sense in that case that that's how they would advance their civilization for anyone who's played civilization or seven wonders or anything like that you know that there's several different several different ways that a society can advance and progress and like you can focus on arts and culture or you can focus on war (laughs) and like have one of those be your dominant or like you can have an even spread to kind of get you moving forward in society so So this is like example a random aside it's 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 related to this but it's not it's not totally on track but it's kind of on track I'm just gonna like take the opportunity to talk about um the in France the Gauls in France so um in France the word is actually Gaulois instead of the Gauls and that's just the way they say it here uh but why I want to mention it is because when I first moved to Toulouse um, I found out that there was a Galois village, like just outside of the city. And this is still mm-hmm. one of my favorite places because basically it's a it's a recreation village, but it's really done in the sense like a bunch of people that had gotten into like uh, anthropology and archaeology got together and they decided to recreate this, to build this village and recreate it in the way that a typical Gaul village would have existed. So, oh, and they actually got archaeologists and stuff to work on it. They were like, the archaeologists, and the they were they were all they were all university cool. students when they started the village. So cool. it's really interesting because even the way that the village is set up. When you go to visit it, there's a parking lot. You park your car and then you have to walk quite a way to get inside because Mm -hmm. all of the fields where they would keep their animals and stuff are set up on the outside. And then there's like the gate that would honestly be like a protection kind of gate. Interesting. And uh, the whole layout and everything that they built there, they built by hand. And it's really interesting because they partake in all of the activities that would have been, uh, would have been 
existing in the community at the time. So there is a place there that um, where they carve, they carve leather, like they make leather and then they carve it with all of the, like the Gaulish designs and stuff. And there's also a pottery, a place where they make pottery. There's a place where they make brass pieces, brass jewelry, armbands, things like this, like stuff that they actually would have had people in the community doing at the time. There's the herbalists that take care of the herbal garden and like make the herbal remedies and things like this. Mm -hmm. There's even, um, there's even guys that do basket weaving. And this is really particular. There's two things that are the most interesting about this village is the basket weaving and what's at the top of the village because they also have it laid out the way a Gaul village here would have been laid out. You know what I mean? Interesting. So, yeah. So in the basket weaving element, it's really interesting because they have deduced on their own by experimenting there. They know that within France, not only like not only do we know the Celts went all up and down the water, like the the seas and the oceans, but they know here in France they traded by going along the rivers, but they didn't mm-hmm. have big boats, so they tried to figure out how could they get around on the rivers, and using the basket weaving, they've developed these um, small. These tiny, honestly, it looks like a cup. It looks like you're sitting inside a cup, a weaved cup. And they're, they are pretty, pretty, pretty certain. And I think there is some also, because I think I didn't mention it, but this spot was actually on a spot where they did an archaeological dig. They found gall stuff there. That's why mm-hmm. they chose this spot to recreate the village. Very so cool. they they found some of these baskets and they were like trying to figure out what they were for. And they've basically figured out now that it was to help them get along all of the canals and the rivers. And it's really just big enough for one person, but they'll show you how they built them. They'll show you how they got up and they went up and down the rivers, how they carried the goods to trade up and down the rivers. It's It's really really that's so cool I freaking love this place it's like one of my favorite places to go honestly and um they also have a blacksmith because blacksmithing would have been incredibly important there um in those villages but what's really interesting is what's at the very top of the village it kind of goes on a spiral almost and when you get to the Mm -hmm. top there's this very bizarre place uh that's marked by two pillars that has a bunch of like goat skulls on it and yeah and you walk inside and um there's broken clay pots everywhere and basically this would have acted as a sacred site because it's at the top of a hill and we'll talk about this a bit more in celtic and druid tradition when we get into the druid stuff but the top of a hill would have been a very significant place an apex right Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the place where either they would do like sacrifices, but most importantly, where they would prepare for wars when they would go into battle. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, the Gauls particularly were known for having the blue spiral paint painted all over them. Right. And when they Mm -hmm. would go into battle, they would drink some concoction. I can't remember exactly what it is, but they would drink some concoction that would get them all hyped up and get them like ready to just like fucking fight it out, you know? And in their big, big battles, they would have these huge like brass looking horns, these gorgeous elaborate horns that people would carry and they would march with them. They would blow the horns to let people know that they were coming. These, these jacked up guys all like <laughs> hopped up on goofy juice and like whatever with all these blue paints on them to make them look scary. And they would, this is how they would be like rolling up to war. So this place at the top of this village is actually a recreation of like the place where they would gather to like prepare to go to like get everybody That's riled awesome. up. Maybe they would do a ceremony there. Maybe they would do a ritual. Maybe they would do a sacrifice there. You know what I mean? And Probably all of the above. Yeah. And that's why the skulls are kind of like gateway 
are like kind very of like cool. right there. It's neat. It's very neat. There's oh, also a spot. Yeah, there I'll next time you come I'll take you. There's also a spot there where they they found um remnants of what they think were sacrifices mm. as well. Um not not at the top, but once you kind of like go down a little bit and around. Yeah. It's a great it's a great place. Very but this cool. is where very I discovered cool. this is where I discovered that that even existed. <laughs> Because I didn't know, before I moved to France, I didn't know about the Gauls. I had no idea that there was like a Celtic association with France. Yeah, they're all over the place. It's wild. So yeah, anyways, that's Um, just an aside, but that's my plug for the, (laughs) they should be a sponsor of this episode. The Wall Village, just outside of Toulouse, check it out. And they also have, in their gift shop, they have some of the best wine you'll ever come across, ever. So Nice. That's awesome. I love a gift shop that sells wine. That that's um, where I discovered that wine, the Roman Gallo the wine. The Hippocras? In the Hippocras and stuff. Oh where, yeah. Yeah. That's where I first discovered it was there. <laughs> yeah. Um so yes, like we're used to kitty. <laughs> we're used to kitties. <laughs> we're used to kitties. We're used to when we think of Celtic mythology, we think of Irish mythology. And it, it, we've kind of discovered that their mythology is very while interesting very confusing sometimes Mm -hmm. so historians have actually divided it into four main cycles like specifically the irish mythology into four uh, main cycles Mm -hmm. and its purpose is to basically categorize the legends and tales according to their era so each main cycle has a certain world or a certain theme that it evokes and they vary. So in chronological order, there are the mythological cycles. So myths and mm-hmm. fantastical legends, which I think is the most interesting. Yeah. The Ulster cycle, which focuses on warriors and battles. Then the Fenian, which is also called the Finn cycle or Finian tales, which deals of legends with warriors and heroes in ancient Ireland. So mm-hmm. it can get confused with the previous cycle a little bit, but warriors were sometimes regarded as these divine figures. And then the King cycle, which is known as the historical cycle. And it's about Kings and bards and like history. So oh, interesting. Yeah. The mythological cycle about myths and legends it makes up the most of Irish legends. And that is where we have a bulk of this Celtic tradition and like Mm. where a lot of it is still kind of comes from and why we think about it. And it basically revolves around gods and mythical races and Mm. includes most of the legends that are involved with races like the Tua de de Nan. Mm -hmm. And, they are, I'm just going to bring them up because I think it's cool. So they are apparently a magical race of people with supernatural ability. And so they've got super strength, super speed. They're ageless. They're immune to diseases. They're like this cross between X-Men and elves or something. Ooh, cool. And <laughs> most of them are these godlike creatures and divine beings that were being worshipped. And the I race is, is also where believed. The Dagda deity comes from, yeah. Yeah, so like they believe in actually the goddess Danu, Mm -hmm. who's referred to as more of the mother, Mm -hmm. and their name kind of translates to followers of the Danu, and it's said that they come from the other world, which the only thing I'll say on that now is the other world is a place of peace and abundance, and like Asgard. It, yeah, (laughs) I said that for a reason. Right. Like, I mean, now that you know where, where this started and where it led to, it kind of feels like a bit of an offshoot of uh, Norse stuff in a way. Anyways, no, that's like a really bold uh, blanket statement. I don't mean it in a bad way, but it just seems like some of that, you know. Oh, I think it's so interesting to see how civilizations have progressed in different areas of the world. And a lot of the similar, similar themes like keep coming up wherever Mm -hmm. you are. Yes. They they get there on their own, whether it's through people moving from one place to another or invading, or it's just like this process that humanity has in terms mm-hmm. of its evolution, mm-hmm. which I think it's really cool. Um, yes. So yeah, the other world is this place of peace and abundance. It's where these divinities, if we want to call them that, kind of come from. 
also possibly where the dead spirits reside. Mm. And the skill of the Tua De basically allowed them to become rulers, druids, bards, heroes, healers. Like they're, they have this supernatural prowess that basically led them to be revered within Celtic mythology. Mm. And that's all well and good. And, and, you know, we talk about Danu, but like the main Celtic god, if we were to think of a Celtic god, is probably you just mentioned it, mm. the Dagda. Mm-hmm. He's kind of like an all-powerful god or all-father, partially because of his protective qualities. Um, he's kind of, if we're going to have a chief god of the Celtic pantheon, he'd probably be it. He'd probably hold like a similar status to Odin or mm. Zeus or Anil or anything like that. And is this just within the Irish deities or does that transcend into other? Because we know sometimes they overlap, right? Does it They overlap? do overlap. So for certain in Irish deities, but I think that there are some big ones that transcend and overlap. So I think that Lu, the Dagda, and and what, what did I just say the goddess was? Danu? Yeah. <laughs> all probably overlap. They're mm-hmm. all really, really big gods and goddesses. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. Yeah. Like Danu's this divine mother goddess. And- right. And it kind of makes sense because her name is very similar to Dagda, which is like the all father. It's like yeah. that counterbalance. We see that again. Exactly. Exactly. That's really cool. Yeah. It's just so interesting, like how you can you kind of need to break it down, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's just, I can see why people get so frustrated with like, you know, kind of what the generalization is of Celtic mythology or just culture in general, when you can see that it's so rich and so full. And, uh, you know, we kind of think about like Celtic knots and Celtic harps and (laughs) <laughs> upon first glance anyways upon first well yeah and we don't really do much more research so I actually I decided to do a little bit of research on and focus on the Dagda not a whole lot but I just wanted to like understand if he's this Odin like character or Zeus like character what that actually means mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so like of course he's this giant bearded man because gods have beards always apparently yes and <laughs> beard man beard yeah he's giant he's got a woolen cloak he's regarded as a druid and Uh is portrayed as being wise and crafty which i thought was Mm -hmm. kind of interesting Mm -hmm. and it's interesting that a lot of these deity type creatures the two a day these supernatural figures become druids Mm -hmm. some of them not all but like they become that which shows you how druids were elevated in society and thought of in society Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the surviving depictions we have of the Dagda, he's described as being this oafish creature with ill-fitting clothing and like an unruly beard. Interesting. And this was probably introduced a lot later by Christian monks that were very eager to paint these gods as comedic figures and make them a lot less competitive with uh, the Christian god. Oh, snap. Okay. But even in these less flattering portrayals, the Dagda would often keep his wit and wisdom. They couldn't fully strip him of that. Mm -hmm. So in Celtic myths, the Dagda was believed to dwell at Brunaboina or the valley of the river. And that is in modern day county Meath, so central eastern Ireland. And this valley is where the site of these megalithic monuments that are called passage graves are mm-hmm. and they they date back like six thousand years <laughs> um and include like the new grange site which is older than stonehenge and the pyramids mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is crazy wow. and aligns with the rising sun on the winter solstice mm-hmm. and it kind of reaffirms the dagda's connection with time and with seasons so mm. as this father of the Irish pantheon he's got lots of children by lots of different lovers and again like it's similar to Zeus or Odin or anything Mm -hmm. like that right his wife is Morrigan 
and mm-hmm. she's the goddess of war and fate. And her mythology is not really well defined. In some accounts, she's like this trio of goddesses. Mm. So again, the triple goddess form. Um, we know she's described as a jealous wife. It's so <laughs> crazy. We hear the name Morgan. We hear the name Morgan. We hear it like all through the Arthurian legends. We hear it now. She hear she's yeah. a deity. And it's like, There's not much information, but some guys (laughs) decided throughout all of century, all of these past centuries that they like the name. (laughs) Yeah, but they don't like the person who wears it, apparently, because she's a jealous wife. (laughs) Of course, of course. Then our Irish goddess, Bridget, is probably one of the most notable of Dagda's offspring. And again, like she's later, she later becomes this Christian saint of the same name and Mm. still enjoys prominence among neo-pagan movements as a goddess figure with neo-druidic traditions today. She was believed to have two oxen, an enchanted boar, an enchanted sheep, and the animals would cry out whenever there was a plunder being committed in Ireland. And it kind of reaffirms her role as like relating to this guardian of protection. Aww, it's cute. Yeah, it's cute, right? Angus is the most prominent of his many sons. He's the god of love and poetry. And he's the results of an affair between Dagda and this river co- goddess named Bowen, who is married to someone named Elkvar. And Dagda oh sent Bowen's husband away on a trip so that he could be with Bowen. And like he knew she was going to become pregnant. And he, she was going to become pregnant that day because he made the trip last for nine months. But because Dagda locked the sun in the sky, uh, uh, it l- seemed like it was just one day. Like Elkver perceived it as just him being away for one day. It was just a really, really long day. And so the child, is, yeah, Angus, was born in a single day, the day that his father was away. <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Because the sun never went down. My word. The sun never went down. This sounds Never went down. so Zeusy, right? This, this sounds so influenced by Rome. I feel like, <laughs> don't you think? It's hard. Yeah, it very well could be. His parentage is unclear. He is described as having two brothers, though. Sometimes they kind of just describe it as different facets of him. But mm-hmm. what I think is really cool about the Dacta is his treasures. So he carries three sacred treasures with him: a cauldron, mm-hmm. a harp and a staff for a club. And mm-hmm. each of these is a really unique and powerful re- relic that kind of plays into the myths. So the, the Quira Onsik, or the undry cauldron, is also kind of referred to as the cauldron of plenty. It was a magic cauldron that would fill the bellies of everyone who gathered around it. There's also hints that it could heal wounds and possibly revive the dead. So it was a very special magical item. And it was one of the four treasures that the Tua de Danan, those magical people, brought with them from the other world when they first came to Ireland. Mm-hmm. Then his club of life and death. <laughs> Boom. It's basically the English translation. It's called the Great Club or the Club of Wrath. Because I don't know how to say it in, in like the old words. Um, <laughs> the Dagda's weapon. Yeah. So it's this club or a mace and with, with a single blow it could kill as many as nine men. Ooh. And with a mere touch from its handle, it could restore the life to someone that was slain. Mm, interesting. And then I really like this one. He has a magical harp. And the music of this harp has the power to change the emotions of men. So oh, it could remove fear from... Yeah, it could remove your fear before a battle. It could dispel your grief after a loss. And one story is one of the most powerful of his relics, probably. One story is the Tua Dei would fight the Fomorians, who were another supernatural race. And they were at war with each other all the time. They were aware of Dagda's harp and noticed that he was playing it before the battles. Again, probably to dispel this fear before battle. So they thought that the loss of the harp would really, really weaken the two a day and that they could defeat them in battle that way. So they snuck into Dagda's home while they were blocked in battle. Like another team kind of went and snuck into his home, grabbed the harp and fled with it to a deserted castle. And 
that night, after like the battle kind of subsided and each went their own way, the remaining Fomorians bedded down. So all of them were at this castle and they were between the entryway and the harp. Mm -hmm. So between the entryway and the harp, there's just like a bunch of Fomorians sleeping. And they thought that this would prevent it from being stolen back. And there was no way that the Dagda could get past them to retrieve it. Mm -hmm. So the Dagda realizes that his harp is missing and he's accompanied by two people. One of them is Lou. Um, The other one is Ogma. And they're looking far and wide. And eventually they find this castle where the Fomorians have hid. And they kind of enter and they see this mass of people sleeping. And they're like, there's no way that we can get to it. But fortunately, Dagda has a really simple solution. Kind of like Thor's hammer. He just extends his arm and the harp flies to him. Oh, yeah. And the Fomorians wake up with this sound of like a swish in the air. And they're like, okay, well, they've got the harp, but like we outnumber them. So they get their weapons drawn. And then Lou's just like, you should play your harp. You should play your harp right now. So he strums the harp and he plays the music of grief. And the Fomorians just drop down and they're weeping uncontrollably and they're lost in despair and they sink to the ground. They drop their weapons until the music ends. And then they realize what happens and they start to advance again. And then he decides to play the music of mirth. And they're laughing and they're so overcome that, again, they drop their weapons and they're (laughs) bent over in laughter and like dancing joyously all of a sudden. And then he stops the music and they start to advance again. And then he plays a final tune so soft it could barely be heard. It's the music of sleep. And then they collapse into a very deep sleep. And at that point, they slip away with the harp. Interesting. And I kind of love that for a few reasons. I love the fact that there was still honor in battle, that they refused to slaughter them in their sleep. Mm -hmm. True. Right? Mm -hmm. And I also love the fact that he just fucked with them and was like, I'm going to make you cry. Now I'm going to make you laugh. Then I'll make you go to sleep. Yeah. I just think it's so funny. That is cool. I like it. I really like his relics. His relics seem like unique. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's really Unique and not, right? Because it's still like a cauldron, a club, and a harp. And we see different Sorry. gods with I mean unique to like the Celtic de- the Celtic kind of yeah. culture, you know? Like the harp is very reminiscent of, you know, Celtic music and things like that. Yes. The cauldron's very predominant throughout most of – I don't think that – all people that are like, you know, neo-pagan or like anything modern, I don't necessarily know that they know that the cauldron is really primarily from, we see it the most in like Celtic lore. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think those are kind of, they, they seem like we can hear parts of the story where it almost sounds like, is this this because we don't know? Is it this yeah. God's true story or is it like remnants? of a Roman story that's getting like a new facelift. You know what I mean? But that part. We don't know. But those things, those things seem like, you know, unique to to this, these kind of umbrella of stories and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. There were, there like Orpheus was a Greek God that had a harp too. So it's like, it is hard to say actually now that you now that you're bringing it up like yeah it's hard to say whether this is the original story we don't know this is the story that we have now oh we'll never (laughs) we'll never know but that's like part of the the fun is kind of seeing how these things all intersect with each other right yeah at least for me i thought it's been part of the fun of this yeah i agree um but yeah i thought i'd explore at least like one figure of a specific Celtic pantheon just a little bit because yeah the whole thing is allegory story so we need to tell a story oh and I think we should (laughs) I think we we should probably I would love if in the next couple of episodes we could kind of like at some point visit some more of these stories I think we I think it's a good idea I think we should do that because I have some Celtic Portuguese stories for you for the other world yay okay so that's gonna come up (laughs) soon But I think that pretty much kind of 
covers, I, I hope we've done, we've tried to give you a very brief, at least, <laughs> overview of time related to the Celts and an over a brief overview of the different groups that were in the Celts and then the deities associated to it. So um, just to give you an idea of the, the outline of the structure, it's vague, but that's up to you. If you're interested <laughs> in it, you can explore it more because it's so interesting and so fascinating. And uh, there's so much to kind of understand about the Celts, who they were and where they were and what they believed. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, We will see you next time. Remember to like and subscribe, follow the things. (laughs) Follow the things. Allegory Story Podcast on everything. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll see you next time.